I'm Mark Golub, and in the news for days now has been the events surrounding the brutal, senseless murder of George Floyd, an African-American man accused of passing a counterfeit $20 bill who was then taken to the ground and handcuffed by a Minneapolis police officer, Derek Chauvin, who then callously, wantonly put his knee on the neck of Mr. Floyd. And despite Floyd's pleas that he could not breathe, kept his knee there for eight minutes and 46 seconds until George Floyd died. And to make matters worse, apparently there were other policemen watching who did nothing to stop Jarek Chauvin from murdering George Floyd. Well, as I'm sure you all know, the city of Minneapolis erupted in anger over what certainly seems to be a racist murder by a white city policeman. Thousands of people filled the streets in protest, demanding that Jarek Chauvin be charged with murder and that the other policemen at the scene be charged as well. And then the tragedy multiplied. What started as a righteous protest turned into an ugly, violent mob, which somehow felt it had a license to destroy businesses, burn down buildings, set fire to cars, and virtually destroy the life's work of a piece of the Minneapolis community, which in the main is African American itself. The violence culminated in the torching of a Minneapolis police precinct, which was ordered by the mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Frey, who happens to be Jewish, to evacuate the precinct rather than defend it in an attempt to avoid more casualties among the rioters, which would have escalated the situation still further. The American people as a whole saw what was happening in Minneapolis. And throughout the country, we were horrified by the senseless, brutal, mean, venal murder. We saw the people who filled the streets in frustration and anger. And in cities across the country, people took to the streets in solidarity with the people of Minneapolis. And again, sadly, there were other instances where protests turned into mobs of violence across the country. But the murder of George Floyd has become a moment in contemporary American history that has marked this time. It has even pushed the coronavirus off the front page and has seemed to make people oblivious of the need to social distance during this current pandemic. It should be mentioned that Mr. Chauvin was charged with murder and manslaughter. It is yet to be seen what the other police officers will be charged with. And this is surely not the first instance of police brutality. And George Floyd is not the first African American to lose his life at the hands of a white police officer. There have been charges of police racism and brutality for years, for decades. Some would say for generations. So the entire event has not only stunned the country, it's brought the country to a stop, standstill, to a halt. So how has the Jewish community of Minneapolis been affected by these events? What's it meant for and to the Jews of Minneapolis, and for the twin city of St. Paul as well? Well, for some answers, we turn to two of Minneapolis's leading rabbinic 
figures. I am honored to be joined by Reform Rabbi Marsha Zimmerman of Temple Israel of Minneapolis. Rabbi Zimmerman has been the senior rabbi at Temple Israel since 2001, when she had the distinction of becoming the first female senior rabbi of a congregation with more than 2,000 families. And I'm also honored to be joined by conservative Rabbi Harold Kravitz, the rabbi of Adath Jeshurun Congregation in Minneapolis, which he served since 1987. Rabbi Kravitz also serves on the Rabbinical Assembly's Professional Ethics Committee and has helped to develop the conservative movement's Juda Jewish movement in Israel, which is known as Masorti. And Marsha and Harold, thank you so much for giving us some time on JBS. I'm honored to share this channel with you. Thank you. So, you know, I could begin with either one of you. Marsha, yeah. first, I want to give you a chance to say anything you want yeah. about how yeah. you and the Jewish community that you serve, Temple Israel, <clears throat> has responded in any way to the events of this past week. Yeah. So there's so many things that go through my head. We are an urban congregation. We have made a commitment for 90 plus years, actually 140 plus years to be in the city of Minneapolis. And we are very proud that our address is not only our geography, but our mission and vision. And so the idea that we need to be a good neighbor and what that means is crucial a jewish voice in the city often um, and we are part of a large interfaith group as well of other city congregations and mosques and communities um, unitarian universalists and we have uh, gotten together to do a lot of work around the response to george floyd's murder and also to, um, and we can say murder now because that, that's the charge, um, when we had a deadly police encounter is another way to talk about this. Um, so we take that very seriously. But I just want to respond quickly to what you were saying, Mark, in that um, assumption, and I think the narrative that, first of all, there is George Floyd's incredibly horrific and tragic death. And then what happened with the protesting and what you then said turned into riots, that's not the narrative we have here. Here is that it is clear there were infiltrators in the midst of um, this reaction to George Floyd's death. There are anarchists, there are Nazis, there are people coming in to rile up and to take advantage of this situation. And that's where the most of the violence has happened in our city. And that is why we have been under curfew for two nights, just heard from the governor two more nights, in order to snuff out and put an end to really outside people who are using George Floyd's death for bad intent in using the upset and the rage and outrage of the communities of color, the black, brown, and indigenous communities, and other communities to create violence and put this city in a blaze. So I just want to be really, really careful about the idea of using words like riots or looting because they have racial overtones and there is a lot of assumption implicit bias that happens through that. Uh, I so I'll make, just end I'll, by saying yes. I want to make sure I understand you and the audience understands you. You have made a distinction and I was, I was going to get there at one point and I pr appreciate you're getting there right away. There are many who've claimed and there seems to be hard evidence that a lot of the more violent mob-like activity of a riot was instigated by people who are not from Minneapolis, they're not even from Minnesota. And I've read a great deal up from all kinds of reports and uh, 
your attorney general, uh, Ellison, yeah. was on Meet the Press, and mm -hmm. he was asked this question, and USA Today has written about it, and it is clear that there were people from the outside who came in. Last night on the, on the news, a, um, the person who was in charge, I may be able to find his name, he's in charge of the uh, Department of Security in um, Minneapolis, who talked about- Langer, Langer? Yes. Langer. That yeah. he found, a that they have friend. found canisters buried, with gasoline <laughs> canisters, and they, they, they mm -hmm. found a cache of cars without licenses that were used to bring in people and, and, and mm -hmm. weapons from outside of Minneapolis, to be sure, in Minnesota, m most likely. How, yes. What I don't, I what, I, what, I, what, I hope, what, what I hope you and I are not disagreeing about is that whoever was responsible for it, and I think your point was, you don't want Minneapolis people to, or the indigenous community that was protest, that started out as a protest, you don't want them to be accused of starting the riots that did lead to violence. What you're, you're not arguing that there were no violence or were no more riots. Right. What you're, what you're right. saying is make a dis we, people who watch should be making a distinction who's responsible for it. Do I understand you correctly? So you are understanding me correctly. And there is you know, who is mourning George Floyd? Communities of color are mourning this man who is in a long lineup of other unarmed black, brown, and indigenous people who have not been treated well by the police. And that needs, and they have been over and over and over told that justice will bear, and they are over and over and over disappointed about justice not being served. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. There is rage and outrage in that community as we stand with them. Um, Ken, I'm not a police officer. I am not a security person. But what I want your, your um, audience to know is that it is much more complicated because of what's been brought into our state and how this moment in our history has ignited people to use it for violence and for hate. And that is what I want everyone to understand, what's happening in our state and in our city particularly. But, but Harold, you haven't said anything, so please. No, I, I, hold, I, hold, on, one, I, hold on, hold on one second. I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate your, your attempt to help me go forward. I. This is, I'm just giving now a stat that I've heard, and Harold, you do respond to this, although Harold, I want to give you the same opportunity just to say anything you want to say, but in, as we, as I conclude this portion of it with Marsha, so the Minnesota, Minnesota governor, Tim Walz, mm -hmm. said that 80% of the violence came from outside the state. Okay. I trust, I trust my governor. I trust our governor. It's okay, but I'm not done. <laughs> the arrest records that have been published show that 52% of the residents, 52% of the people arrested for violence were residents of Minneapolis or St. Paul. I don't know anything. I'm only telling you that what I'm trying to do here is be as uh, both as honest and as objective as I can be, and to give you a chance to really talk about the mood and the feeling and the concerns of your respective communities. It seems to me, you know, what, what, when Ellis and Keith Ellison went on Meet the Press, he was asked, outside ad agitators, yes, where were they from? Were they right wing? Were they left wing? And everybody's saying they, it's the other side. And Keith Ellison, I thought, said something quite honest and profound. We don't know yet. So I don't want to go there. All I know is that what I believe was an honest, well-intentioned, civil disobedient protest, which is part of America, turned ugly. And it seems to have turned ugly 
because many people from the outside were agitating to make it happen. I also, my instinct is that when I read, read the reports, it is not only people from outside. And that's why a mob is so horrible because a mob turns people into doing things they would not normally do. All right, Harold, I also want your, sure. your response in general. Uh, how did you know, your congregation, how did the Jews that you deal with, how did you respond to the events surrounding Mr. Floyd's murder? So before I comment on that more generally, I want to pick up where my colleague Rabbi Zimmerman has started. Uh, it was fascinating listening to your um, comments introducing the program and just to hear how these events are being perceived. And I think you're hearing from us that um, many of us feel like there's um, a gap in understanding what's going on here. And it is heartbreaking. I mean, it is heartbreaking to see the city that we love being ripped to shreds, work of unbelievable efforts to build up this community. This community has an extraordinary history of being able to work together to address civic problems. Where's the gap? It, What's, where's well, the gap, continue. Harold? It also has an extraordinary history of inequality. Uh, there is There are gaps, racial gaps of racial difference, Around no, you said there was, a, I think what you said was there was a, that you are disturbed by the gap of people's understanding of what happened. And you said it in reference to the introduction that I gave to the program. And mm -hmm. this is one of the reasons why I so much wanted to talk to you and Marsha, because sure. I'm worried all the time that the media presents a story and that whether you watch it on CNN, or you watch it on MSNBC, you watch it on Fox, you watch it on ABC, you watch it on NBC. Television channels tend to shape a story to make it interesting for their, for their news and their ratings. And I wanted to hear from you and Marsha, are there gaps in our sure. understanding, in my understanding, as you heard me describe it? Because if there are gaps in the story or in what the story means, it's the most important thing I can ask you and Marsha to do. And we appreciate that. Um, I'll, you know, I have to say, it's, the press plays a very important role. And we have seen the press locally playing a heroic role, being out on the streets at night, putting themselves in the face of danger to try to report on what's happening and to give us a sense of what's happening when we are staying at home as we need to and should be, uh, as should everybody else. But uh, they put themselves at risk, and it's really, um, they, you know, in a time when press is uh, vilified from quarters that should, be, should know better and speak more responsibly to see the press treated that way. And um, there's some terrible stories coming out from the press as they're experiencing this on the ground here. At the same time, it's an enormous responsibility to be a member of the press. Uh, in the article that reported after really the terrible um, I don't know what to, how to describe it, but just unbelievable unleashing the violence and destruction. And the first paragraph of the story in the Star Tribune, which has done a lot of good work covering it, but it said, you know, all this happened as a result, I don't have the exact words, but as a result of, you know, this um, terrible thing with George Floyd. And I was like, wow, like, really? Like, did they so, did the writer somehow miss the fact that this is not about one incident. This is about a country that has for centuries had to deal with terrible racism. And you know, I just finished reading a biography of Frederick Douglass. And you read about like, you know, what was leading up to the Civil War and what happened in Reconstruction and in Jim Crow and in pervasive and continuing racism that this country needs to address. So this is yet one more ugly chapter in that story. And anybody who thinks that this is all about that one terrible incident in a picture that has, I mean, it's unfortunate that it's put Minneapolis on the map and it's sent this image across the world. And it's not the Minneapolis any of us here um, believe to be representative. And it's so, it's so sad. I mean, I heard, when I heard that there are in 175 cities around the world, there is 
unrest and um, George Floyd's name is being associated with it. And so we can't ignore that connection. However, it is a huge misreading to think that this is only about that. Okay, that but I hope, I, hope you, I hope you did hear in my open, I did not suggest that this was a unique event and that he is not the first and that this is, this is endemic of a certain racism that has existed for decades, some say for generations. So I want to make sure you didn't mishear me. And my sense when I see, when I talk to people, when I see reports, everyone is saying that this is a, this was such a dramatic symbol of something that people feel is systemic. Not that George Floyd was unique, but to the contrary, that George Floyd is a victim of something that is more systemic to American society, but the grotesqueness of it and the fact that it was visually in our face has done something to raise a, to raise a consciousness among the people, not simply in Minneapolis, but as you said, around the country and around the world. So while I think you're absolutely right, I, don't, I have not heard anybody suggest something different, Harold. Look, I think people, uh, it's fascinating to hear how people are processing what's happening. And I think people are struggling. And I, you know, I, I've heard people say, including people associated with our community, um, who are just trying to wrap their brains around the destruction that's been unleashed in Minneapolis and in communities that could least afford it, uh, on top of the destruction of the pandemic to now have to deal with this. I mean, it's horrifying. But it, again, it's, I think people are processing it, and I think it's very important, um, Mark, and I'm glad to hear what you just said, to help people see it more broadly, and that's that's what okay. we are. Very, sort of very fair. Look, one mm -hmm. of the again, unfortunately, I don't have yeah. endless time here, so I need you both to address in just a couple minutes each. I want to know what are you experiencing with your congregation? How do they react, and how do they react to two things? Number one, the horror of the murder, and what it says about racism in general, and two, how do they respond to? what started as protest becoming a violent, destructive, city-burning mob. And I want to hear whether, you, whether this is something your congregants talk to you about, you hear it about, they care about, or not. So, Marcia, try to address that question to the extent to which you can. So what I, um, what I want to also say is that it was a citizen who videotaped the death of George Floyd and that without that videotape, I'm not sure what we would know. And so it's the power of citizens that are, it's very crucial to the story. Um, and I think that that's an important point to make. Um, so the Jewish community, I think the Jewish community um, feels the real hurt and pain because we ourselves have been and continue to be. People are using this as well as an ability to speak anti-Semitic rhetoric. Um, and so the issue is that we are a community that has felt the hatred and, and, and horror of what violence and hate crimes can do. So people are very much wanting to connect. Um, in the Jewish community, there are businesses that are around the area that George Floyd died in, Jewish owned businesses who are just, it's just, they're destroyed. They're destroyed. And so there is a great personal pain in the community for individuals, families who have had for 
um, really generations, institutions, and family-owned businesses in the area and have been very involved with their neighbors and their community. And um, that is a painful reality for the people who are in our congregations and in our community. I think um, I really believe that some of this violence that has erupted is um, so painful and that we talk about that more than we talk about these systemic things. And I think that's what Rabbi Kravitz was trying to say so well, is that we can be focused on what has happened in the aftermath, which can be pain and outrage and generational trauma. Um, and then what also is outside people. I want to hear what Harold has to say to the same question. How has your Jewish community responded to this, Harold? So I wouldn't presume to speak for the Jewish community because we're a diverse group. Uh, that diversity extends to our congregation. Um, but I was, it was really, um, and, and we're also uh, in a really difficult time. All of our congregations, our buildings are closed and we're trying to engage our people, our members, our community uh, using Zoom and, you know, everything that we do now is online. Our minion meets every day, morning and evening online, our Shabbat services are online. So it is very hard to answer that question when you're just not able to just be with people the way we would normally out of safety concerns. Having said that, I am, um, it was interesting, this past Shabbat morning, I, um, again, it's only the second Shabbat that we've done a Zoom service, but at, uh, towards as the service was concluding, there were two things that I shared. One was a very powerful comment that came from a speech by Martin Luther King that was given in the early 1960s called The Other America. It had been posted, this part of the speech had been posted by um, a friend of our congregation, our community, Sandra Samuels, who has done amazing work on the North Side, which was formerly a Jewish neighborhood, now largely African-American. And basically it said, calling on uh, Americans in the early 60s after the Watts and Chicago riots to recognize that you couldn't just talk about a summer of discontent. You had to look at what was happening or not happening during the winter that should have been done, the work that needed to be done that has resulted in these terrible, terrible outbreaks of anger. And I rage. understand. So I was pleased. And then I read from a beautiful well, passage. I, I, again, by, it's, if I had all the time in the world, I'd go on. I need you to answer one simple question that I haven't heard. And it, it may be totally off base, but I want to ask it to you anyway. Does Anyone in the Jewish community of Minneapolis, who basically is white, feel in any sense a, either a sense of failure on their own part or a sense of responsibility for the general context that both of you have spoken so beautifully about? It's interesting. My, I have a feeling you know everybody wants to say it's the other guy who's racist. And I wonder the extent to which the Jews of Minneapolis are saying, oh my, we're partly at fault here. Do either of you have anything to say about that? Sure. 20% so of, of our population is of color. So we really can't say Jews are all white. Go for it. I'm so sorry. I, you, one... I, I want to make sure I understand. You have 20% of your congregation is black? Jews of color. So Jews come from all over the world. Yeah, there are Jews of color. From um, where? I, from where? So, yeah, so I have a sense. Are you talking about Sephardic Jews? And okay. Go for it. Here, so I see. think it's really important for, um, I think what Rabbi Zimmerman was pointing to is for us to be really careful about our language and recognizing that the American Jewish community is diverse. There was just a very big debate that just was taking place a week ago about what the percentage is. Is it 12 to 15? Is it 6%? Everybody agrees that it's growing and it's a valued part of our community. So we have to be really careful about uh, how we identify our community. So that's the first point. Second point is I don't think anybody would uh, 
would be particularly wise in speaking for the Jewish community. We are a diverse community, diverse politically, diverse in terms of um, our backgrounds, our ethnic makeup, um, and of course, there are many things that we hopefully unite us. So again, we can't really give you an answer to that question of what do the Jews think? Jews think a lot of different things. Uh, I can tell you that um, at the end of services, when we had a kiddish this past Shabbat, I was really moved, and it was you know, self-selecting, but those members who showed up and entered into a discussion about the question of what is our responsibility, and that's, that was the question I asked, what is our responsibility? Um, using a beautiful liturgical poem by a colleague, Cantor Rachel Stock Spielker on Alenu, right? What's on us? Mm -hmm. What's our responsibility? Good for you. Which drew on the powerful image of bending the knee and how we bend the knee to serve God and this horrible image of bending the knee to extinguish a life. And um, I was so appreciative of, the, of my congregants' concerns expressed about how can we help? How can we help? That was their question. What can we do? And there were people who took up rooms and went into the city at a really dangerous time in terms of COVID-19. Like everybody's social distancing and they pick up room and with their children went in yeah. to show a model of what it means to do something. And then there were people who importantly asked the question of policy. It's not just about service. One broom, sorry, it's not going to make enough of a difference. How do we change things systemically? So that's what I heard on Shabbat morning. And I was thankful. Now we have to struggle with both how do we support members of our Jewish community who are of color, who feel particularly um, vulnerable and, and, and need to be cared for at this time. How do we do direct service? And as people are trying to find that out, ways to do it, the Hama, the Jewish organization, that's a disaster relief organization based and founded here that acts nationally, is now trying to mobilize volunteers locally. And then how do we respond in terms of policy? to address the systemic issues like organizations like Jewish Community Action are working to organize our community to action and the Jewish Community Relations Council has made important statements. And I just would conclude by saying uh, on Sunday, our um, conservative movement for rabbinical assembly, the international organization of, of rabbis, conservative Masorti rabbis put out, a, I think a powerful statement about the issues that just not from today, they go back to 2016, a resolution after what happened in St. Louis. And, you know, those are all responses. Are they adequate? I don't think so, but they're all parts of so how I, we think about this. I can also just say that we have spent the last three and a half years looking inside our community for implicit bias, racism, and looking to open our doors even wider to Jews of color, because we have heard from Jews of color that they walk into their own synagogue and are often asked, are you a guest? because people assume the community looks like, a, you know, looks, looks white, um, Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, and that isn't true. So we as a community are, we've had trainings, we've done something that is a um, it's kind of a, a, an assessment of people's implicit bias, where you are on the the spectrum of acknowledging other nationalities, other people, differences overall, and how you adapt and adopt to that situation. Some people say, I'm colorblind. That's pretty low on this assessment of being um, open to diversity. It's a cultural diversity um, look at the world. And so we have done that for the last three years. We've brought in um, a incredibly dynamic black minister who has worked with us around courageous conversations. The downtown congregations are going to go on a civil rights journey. These things take years and years and years to dismantle. And so George Floyd is a moment that is so painful and that his death should never have happened. And we also, in his memory, better find a way to not be so fragile about our own implicit bias. We need to really struggle with it. Like Jacob as a wrestler to Israel, we really need to wrestle with our own privilege that the Jewish community has been given. But let me tell you, our whiteness can be taken away like that. Let me just tell you. 
it could be taken away like that. We have built our communities on that idea that we are white. According to the 1960 census was the first time we could check off Ashkenazi. Or, no, no one was asking us about Ashkenazi. Could check off Caucasian. Um, but but that can be taken away in a minute and a half. We have seen it with COVID, with the Asian American community, how quickly their whiteness was taken away, their understanding. Um, and so we have to be very careful to dismantle racism is huge. We come against a lot of anger. We come against a lot of fragility within our communities to really confront what that means. And, um, I've been doing this work since I've been 20 years old when I was confronted by one of my black teachers to say, Jews need to get their act together. White people need to get their act together. And, uh, and, um, and it, it, it takes a long time. So we got to get to work. Very well said. By the way, out of curiosity, Marcia, again, if somebody said to me, how long has this problem been going on? When I hear people say it's been going on for decades, maybe for generations, I understand what they're saying. Why has your congregation only done this for the last three and a half years? We um, have included Jews of color and they have asked for this and demanded this. That's how we've done it for this. No, only in the last three and a half years. We, we, haven't, we haven't wrestled with it enough. So, yep. So, you know, I first I want to say thank you to Rabbi Zimmerman, who just a beloved colleague. We have wonderful rabbinic colleagues and uh, others as well in this community. We're very blessed. Um, Temple Israel has hardly just started this work, nor is that true of Badathi Shurim. Right. Um, we, I'm sure, rabbis of both congregations, going back to certainly the 1960s and before, yeah. who have been involved in civil rights work. Um, my uh, several-time predecessor was marching uh, in Selma on behalf of civil rights. These are not new issues to us. Every generation has to grapple with the issues as they present themselves to us. And what I sure. think we heard Rabbi Zimmerman describe so eloquently are the efforts that uh, their congregation have taken uh, under our watch and how it falls on us. Um, as you said, like these issues of racism in America go to the very founding of the country. And we are still living with the consequences and the continuing responsibilities to address them. They don't go away easily and they take serious, serious work. You know, I've been reflecting recently on the fact that going back about four or five years ago, um, our adult learning committee organized a series on racism to get our congregation to really struggle with these questions and our responsibilities. It's part of a series that we call Jewish Studies for a Better World where we both want to learn both Jewish texts and understand problems in depth and then take action, not just be resolved. We felt we didn't cover it adequately. The next year we focused on the issue of racism and the justice system in this country. Powerful, powerful series. So I've been reflecting back on like, so what did we do? Um, I know we didn't do enough. I also know we've been incredibly pulled, right? some of our work around racism has shifted around the issue of immigration, which also deals with issues of racism. And we've been busy trying to address that issue. And, um, and you've heard um, the powerful need and responsibility to address issues of Jews of color who feel like they are not um, viewed as full participants and members of this community, which is um, really, it's a terrible thing that we have to, figure out how to respond to adequately. So, you know, the challenges continue. I think uh, it's true that this searing images of what happened to George Floyd of blessed memory, um, they, they will sear our souls and just, again, remind us that we have responsibilities despite all the demands of um, on clergy, on congregations, uh, in every generation, this is our challenge. And we'll do our best. And I believe it will not be adequate. Uh, and that the next generation of leaders will have to continue to take on and carry this forward. But we'll have to do our very best. Yes. And one day the Messiah will come. You say it very, very well, Harold. Both of you. 
you're, incidentally, Harold, do you think there is racism among the members of your congregation? Absolutely. I mean, of course, no more or no less than anybody else. On Martin Luther King Day, we like to bring out the images of our rabbis who marched with Martin Luther King at Selma. One of the speakers at the series I mentioned earlier about racism took a made a point of saying, you know, it's very nice. We love to pull out those images and we should be justifiably proud of them. But we should also have to acknowledge the ways in which Jews participated in racism then and do now. So none of us can step away from our responsibility. We all have to look in the mirror and, um, and own it. And these are hard issues. And, um, and the work yes, continues. They are. Yes, they are. Marsha, the same question. Do you think you have in your congregation people who are racist? So I think that um, I, I'm going to give you a great example. We live in a racist systemic system. If we don't fight it, we are a part of it. And so there is somebody I read in a book. It's sort of like a moving sidewalk, right? The end of it is this disparities that we have in our society and in our country, racism that's systemic at the end of that walkway. There are people on that walkway who are running towards that. Those are the neo-Nazis. Those are the people who are, want to be racist and actually have racist ideology. Then there are some of us who are on the moving sidewalk and we will just go. We don't even, we're not even aware of what's at the end of it potentially, but we're benefiting from it. And if we don't turn around and go the opposite way on that moving sidewalk, then we are part of the problem. We have to every day. You know how many images of racial, racist images that we get every day in our society all the time? Just turn on the television and look at any television program. There are absolutely racist perspectives given to us every day. If we don't every day work to turn around and walk the opposite way of that moving sidewalk, then we are part of the problem, not part of the solution. Okay. There is a difference between being proactive and not being proactive. What I think I hear you're saying to me is that you're worried that people in your congregation are not sensitive enough, sensitive enough to the way in which they're being bombarded with racist images and that they are not, therefore, sensitive enough to be responding when there is racism all around them. That's a, that is, it's a very important point, and I thank you for it. It's not, it, normally when people think of somebody being racist, Right. They're thinking of something that? proactive. It's something somebody exactly. is doing something racist. In that sense, do you think there's anybody who in your congregation would say, yeah, I think blacks are inferior. I think African Americans should be this, that, or the other thing. Are there people in your congregation? God, who... I hope not. I pray no. no. I don't think so. I've never heard anybody say that. Oh, wait. My, they... my, inst my instinct is you are correct. My instinct is that the problem but... is, and you know, it's, when, when, you get, when you get to it, the analogy or the, the, the metaphor you just used, and people can come up with any metaphor they want. You, you use the, the moving sidewalk. But it's interesting that it sophisticates what it means to be a racist. You know, in the Jewish tradition, you and I, I'm sure you guys teach the same thing. It is clear one is never held responsible for what one thinks or dreams or wishes. We are all held responsible for what we do and whether our actions are in some way counterproductive or in some way harmful to other people. We're never, we are allowed to lust in our hearts we are never allowed to touch another person in some kind of offensive way. And my instinct is that if I were to meet your congregation, I would not find people who were in any way interested in or, 
or involved in activities or actions of a proactive nature that would be discriminatory or be racist and that they would they would be very committed you're, i'm sure your congregations are in, are full of people who are enormously committed to a notion that every human being has equal value and every human being should have equal opportunity and every human being should be free to walk through the streets of America anywhere without fear of anyone, especially a policeman. And my sense is that if I talk to your congregations, this would sort of be a, it'd be a no-brainer. They'd all feel this way. And the issue becomes, as Marcia just said, are people not doing enough not because they're racist themselves, to stop racism where it does, does show its head. And the complexity of that is that most Americans, again, we, here we may disagree. You may agree with me when I describe your congregations. You may disagree with me about the Minneapolis community as a whole. My instinct is the people of America the vast, vast, vast majority of Americans do not want to be racist. And they also may be taken advantage of and not understand the extent to which it is all around them. But Americans in general do not want to impose racist restrictions on any group in America. Now, that is my sense, and as we sort of bring this to a close, you have a right to disagree with me. Harold, do you disagree so we'd with me? So like, I think um, we would, I'd like to think what you say is true. I don't know. But I know there's another Jewish principle that creates a, sets a very high standard for the Jewish people, and that is the concept of lo ta'amod al damreyecha. You may not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. Absolutely. And we know that that places a positive obligation on us as Jews to act when we see injustice and discrimination. Yeah, and again, I, I'm going to say again, Floyd, I, 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 I just don't believe, and I could be totally wrong, I don't live in Minneapolis, I don't know. I cannot believe that there are members of your congregation, Harold, which see injustice of that kind and stand by the blood of their neighbor. I would like to think that's true. I can't step into the hearts of my member or into their private conversations. Um, as I think Rabbi Zimmerman has tried to um, describe, racism is a more complex idea than people sometimes use it when they say, well, I'm not racist. I think they don't understand the full dimension of what racism uh, means and how we contribute to it by our silence, which is the image that Rabbi Zimmerman was conveying. And by it the way, how, Harold, responsibility on us. Harold, does this include you? I think it includes all of us. Does it all of us. No, 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 no. Yes. All of us. Does it include you, Harold? I, I haven't separated myself from the, from the group. I, we all Why can't you say to me yes? Because I think the question is not the right question. You don't like the question? Useful, it's not a useful question. It's a the very useful. Is, but wait, I'll explain to you why it's a useful question. <laughs> very often, everybody thinks the other guy is racist. And you and I and Marsha, we're rabbis. And we have to be honest not only about what the Jewish tradition teaches. And we have to not only try to be sensitive to what the social ills that we are in the midst of are. But we also have to say who we are. And it's easy to, to, to make generalizations. It's very safe. Rabbis can't be safe. Marsha can't be safe. You can't be safe. Harold, I can't be safe. Is the issue that there is, it's not about racism in others. The question <laughs> is the when point. you talk about- Yes, when, I need to own my own racism. And when I look at what happened this week to grapple with my own pain and my lack of ability to understand how this could happen in a community. And that's why being confronted by people who love me 
and who, you know, want me to be at my best, kind of push me to say, like, well, think about this. You know, have friends like Sandra Samuels from the North Side, which was formerly a Jewish neighborhood that fled after riots that were just like this in the 1960s. And I sure contributed to the racism of our community as they fled their homes and their businesses. So we, yes, of course, we, I, am, I have to deal with my own racism. So the answer is yes, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, and in that sense, it's a useful question. Okay, but the broader thank you. sense of the question is, is it misunderstands the nature of racism, which is much more complex and is what we need to be grappling with and interpreting to our people. Because we come away from this and think, well, I don't dislike black people. I want them to get a break. Then we have missed the point. And that's the message that I think many of us are struggling to try to educate about and raise awareness about. And that is, you know, so here we are again. And I fear we will be here yet again in the future. Uh, and the question we will have to grapple with is, what did we do? Did we do oh, enough? Mark, you should just know, I, I have claimed the fact that I have to acknowledge I'm racist, that we all are racist. And that idea here is that, I mean, I've said it in many sermons. I've tried to speak about this in many ways. Um, we, we need to be honest in order to move forward. I, I study psychoanalytic theory. If you don't see the good and the bad in you, at the same time, there's no change or possibility of change. We all have bad in us. We all have good in us. We've got to work in on that bad. Um, if we can't see each other as whole people, then we aren't. There's no possibility of chuva or change. Or um, and so, we, of course, we have to take responsibility for our own racism, and it isn't easy. And I want to reiterate again: it takes daily acknowledgement, daily attention, daily evaluation, and daily change. And I feel badly when I say something's racist, say something that is racist, or I don't see somebody because of the color of their skin, or get a myriad of things that I feel badly about. And I want to be confronted about it because I don't want to be fragile about it. I don't want to be fragile anymore because our fragility, white fragility, is a form of bullying. We have to stop it. We have to say, oh, my gosh, I was wrong. I, I, I do a piece with um, a woman in our congregation, um, uh, a woman of color who talks about three sermons I gave about Jews being white folk and how each time it was so painful. She doesn't say who the rabbi was. And I get up after her and I say, that was me. That was me. I did that. I was wrong. What did you do? I talked about Jews being white folk, which is a not seeing the 20% of the Jews of color who are in our community. It is being it is being unacceptable to say that all Jews are white and Ashkenazi because we're not. And so there was a lot of assumptions in that. And I take ownership, not only because I hurt her, but because I want to show people how to take responsibility for it. I need to be confronted every time I do something all right, that I, perpetuates. But you are, I appreciate the extent you were very thoughtful. Both of you are very, you know, Minneapolis is so lucky to have both of you. I want you to give me one more example, Marcia, of what you have done or how you are racist, not against black uh, Jews of color or Sephardic Jews, but in terms of African Americans. I think that there has been times where somebody of color have come into my community and I have been worried. That, that I've seen that's not okay. Or I've had to go and tell people at the front desk that a minister or an imam is black because it's, I'm not sure how they're going to be treated. That, yeah, but that's, that not is, that's not racism on your part. Well, it's the racism of my community and the no, racism I, no, but of you my... No, I'm only talking about Marsha Zimmerman. 
Yeah, well, I've seen people walk into my community and assume they are guests when they are not guests. And they're members. Your, they're they're boy, members of the Jewish community. And in your mind, that it, you want to equate that with racism in general. That is racist. You know, I it, it's not. There's no need for me to argue with you about it. I can only say to you that when people talk to me talk to me about what racist policy is and what I really want to see stopped. And in the Jewish tradition, you and I, we all, the three of us know the great Midrash, that when the first human being was created, he was created with dust that was white, black, yellow, and red, so that no race could ever say they were somehow first or better or closer to God. In the, sure. Jewish, in the Jewish tradition, racism is impermissible. One cannot be a racist and a Jew. It's not acceptable. It is not compatible. But for me, for the kinds of things you are now mentioning, don't rise to the level of racism that leads to the kind of anywhere near what happened to a George Floyd. And there are things in our society which do lead to George Floyd. And I'm suggesting in a very gentle way, and again, I, I don't know your community, but I know, I, I know, I have a great feel for- You know for your community. You know your community. Yeah, and, and uh, but in my community, <laughs> I don't have people who are racist. And that doesn't mean people don't feel or fear or cross the street if they see it sometimes some black guy coming. That's not racism, in my <laughs> mind. Racism is a matter of social, of, social, of social policy. And the problem that Floyd brings to the fore is a problem of social policy as it, as it applies to police departments across the United States. And that it's important in my mind, and you don't have to agree with me, in my mind it's very important not to conflate the fact that probably, as Harold says, until the Messiah comes, there will be people who feel other people are different. And the question is not how they feel. The question is what social policy will they permit to be implemented in their society? And if there are social policies that allow, that give license to a policeman to murder a guy, and it seems to be he murdered the guy in part because he is black, African-American, that is unacceptable, and every Jew should be outraged. And I have you know, been exploring with you, you're living it. I'm not living it. I watch it on TV. You know, my daughter is marching in New York, but I'm not there. So I wanted insight from you to know, you know, how do you, what's the feeling among the Jews that you live with? And I'll say this again, oh, you, the, um, the community of Minneapolis is so lucky to have you. you. You are two obviously thoughtful, lovely, caring, committed, both people and Jews. And it's wonderful that you took time to, to share your thoughts with me and the JBS audience. Call Tuva Hatzlecha to both of you. I, I hope we get a chance to continue this discussion, but in a different context, not when we're mourning the death of a human being, the, the stupid, nonsensical, hateful, racist death of a human being. So I hope you will let me continue to reach out to both of you. And the conversation we've started now will only end in the distant future. In the meantime, I wish you again, kol tuva hatzlacha, stay safe and stay well during the pandemic. And thank you both for giving us so much time on JBS. Thank, Thank you. you. You take care. You be well. You, You're wonderful. The thoughts of Rabbi Marsha Zimmerman and Rabbi Harold Kravitz. I hope they've given you something to really think about. Two lovely rabbis in Minneapolis. My thanks as always to our director, Sloan Copeland. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Stay safe and be well, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>